Now, ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to our next session of the day on a fantastic topic, the mother of all digital dark art. And to talk on this subject, I would like to call on stage with a big round of applause, Mr. Debashish Jyoti Prakash, Vice President Asia from Qualis. Can we have Debashish with a big round of applause? Debashish, welcome to the panel and welcome to the stage. And we are looking forward to a fantastic presentation from your side. Hello everyone, thank you for coming out of your offices on a weekday. I know it can be tough. I'm a bit cognizant of the fact that we utilize this opportunity to learn something new. So, the you know, introduction to my topic was probably leaving out on the most critical topic on the title. They forgot to say as well. They just said, the mother of all of this is dark right? That we've been able to go come do some black magic here. But it's as well. As well as softer below today, right? While I was preparing this topic in the last two days, I knew that the audience may be a combination of people who are probably listening to as well as an enterprise <coughs> cybersecurity challenge for the first time because well, they're busy doing all the other things and it's consuming a lot of their team's back. So what I did, I tuned it in a way to make it look like it's more informative, consultative, rather than giving a point, answer to a point from it. Right? So we talk about S bar. Today, when you're trying to solve siloed cybersecurity challenges, you are prioritizing between various security initiatives that's supposed to secure your digital transformation journey along a variety of things in your organization. You probably are having a tough time prioritizing it, right? Things like volume management, endpoint protection, risk reduction, all that things you know, jumble in your mind. But one thing that you probably clearly miss is making note of the changing security trends. So what are the trends that I see or we see? We see a lot of focus on risk. People have stopped talking about, I've got 20,000 vulnerabilities, I've got 20,000 CDs, I've got 40,000 tickets, they're not talking about it. They be able to make it, make cybersecurity look more like a risk reduction effort, right? So it's all about focusing on risk, eliminating the ones that have the potential to kill. Right? Very simple to you going to a doctor and telling him, I will go do a full body checkup. You don't treat your broken thumbnail first. There's the least thing, classical interest You're probably looking at your heart first. You prioritize the problem, right? So focus on risk, focus on the riskier matters first. Many times people get confused with the objective of a CISO organization. They think CISO is supposed to be protecting us from risk. No, he's actually supposed to enable business to take more risk. Like this old story of why do we have a brake in a car? It's not about slowing down the car, it's about letting the driver know that he can drive faster because there's a brake. Right? So it's about enabling the organization to take more risk, which in turn means more business. Right? So looking at risk, what's out there, how risky are they, are we taking steps to make sure that the risks and the gaps are plugged in on time, things like that. Looking at the changing arena of modern attack surface. There was a time when attack surface only meant your perimeter assets, then become internal threats, then become crowded containers, then become mobile, then became serverless, all these things, right? So you have an enormous bunch of things adding to your attack surface, probably with every new technology that your organization wants to adopt in a digital process in general. Every time you look at a new technology, it's a headache for the CCT because now this brings in more new attack surfaces. Tool stack consolidation. It is a big trend today. 80% of CISOs would like to consolidate 
their security tool set. They are tired of solving a point problem in a point way. They would like to consolidate not just tools, but processes, teams, budgets, thereby being able to do a much better job at SecOps, IT ops, AI ops, whatsoever. Then comes the ever important job of stakeholder alignment. I've been a part of large projects where the job could not move forward just because the CISO and the CIO team were not in sync. We were running two parallel organizations, running duplicate efforts, right? Not tangling the knowledge or sharing knowledge between each other. So make sure that you have stakeholder alignment. You know, the executive sponsorship to a project is far more important than going and making your spend by the the security data lake or SIM or ADR, right? Then comes automation. If you are trying to attend to cyber security in 2022, it's not a problem of features and functions. It's a problem of scale. Your hackers are probably far more automated than you are. They are spending in automation. You and we are not. Right? Make it difficult or make it less incentivized for the hacker to bother you. Make every step so difficult that he's just let this guy go, let more the next one. Right? You don't you can stop that. You have to face that scale in a way that they get bored and move on. Right? So I, I was telling a friendly CEO friend of mine yesterday. You are an object, your company is an object on an app like Tinder for the attacker. You should swipe left. Move on. You should not swipe right. If you swipe right, he is focused on you now. You have given him elements that you are hackable. So be a swipe left, be happy about getting swipe left. So, how do we do this? You know, a bunch of things that bother this uh, trends are around not being able to do deeper inventory. Everybody says we have a fairly accurate inventory at all times. But the point is, inventory can be done, can be done right only if you are looking at both the breadth and the depth of the craft. You might probably know systems exposed to internet, external attack surface, internal assets behind a DMZ, all these things. But do we really know the depth of it? Open ports on these exposed assets, running services, installed applications, the life cycle of an application, how many certificates are about to expire in the next six months? We have probably sometimes less to about these things. So deeper inventory. When I say deeper inventory, go even deeper. Even if I found uh, in list of installed applications, I should be able to break down that application to what constitutes this application. What are the open source libraries that make this application? Am I using a SaaS? How can I trust that the SBOM of a SaaS is truly okay? Because I'm going to be reliant on them for critical things like managing security, right? Make it a uh, integrated part of your vendor risk assessment so you have visibility into the CI/CD pipeline of toolkits that are using in your organization to protect your organization. Okay? Of course, prevention and risk reduction. Sometimes risk reduction can result in risk elimination, compliance, credit detection response, daily jobs. Now, let's look at this not so popular yet very important journey that is bigger than many companies doing as well. I'll give you a few examples. We have many large customers in India in the range of more than 3 lakh, 4 lakh assets. One company in specific had a directive or a mandate from their CIO office to look at their strategy around securing themselves from open source. So the first thing they had to do was inventory of all open source that they have across their state, right? They had four like assets, four like employees, servers, cloud, you name an asset they have, including assets from 90s. They have not got rid of it. What we found, interestingly, after doing an exercise for a month is that company has 37,000 unique software titles in their software inventory. 37,000 unique software titles. I'm not even talking about Microsoft Office 2010, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, all these things. Microsoft Office is just one category. Teams, communicators, style is one category. 37,000 unique software titles means 37,000 unique ways for the attacker to kill because every unique software there is a tax service. Systems don't get exposed, systems don't get compromised. Something running on them, a misconfiguration on them leads to a compromise. Right? It's not the system which is compromised. It is the element on the system that is insecure 
leading to the compromise. So S bomb is what you need to build now. Go beyond just hardware inventory, asset inventory. Don't make it an IT subject. Don't call it a CMDB section. CMDB has been truly the IT's topic forever. It hasn't solved these bigger problems. IT will definitely not have an idea of all the open source that they have in the US. Zero clue. Interesting numbers around open source second is 80% of open source have not been updated in the last two years. And there is actually no you can open a ticket for it, right? So if you find a vulnerability, leave a tick. Or uh, face a log 4 j like situation, or a zero day, unless something big happens, nobody is fixing the zero day, you fix it. So S bomb is that minute composition of all these constituent elements of software and all the dependencies involved in that. So S bomb which is also called software bill of materials, is a formal record containing the details and the supply chain relationship of the components used in building your software. Now, I'm not sure if you guys know, but there's a US executive order called 14028 that mandates every provider to have a SBOM ready, publicly published. So if you are a vendor working with a federal supplier, they are mandated to now give them a list of any and every you know, tiny, mighty component that they might be using in their CIC file. All the software, all the libraries, all the binaries, version of it, everything. This is a prescribed format. I think I have it in my slide about the minimalistic element of an SO. So, what the US Exec Order 14028 says is the trust we place in our digital infra is directly proportional to how trustworthy and transparent that infra is. Powerful statement, right? You are, you, are, you are bringing in software that you want to trust, but that ends up doing a software supply chain hack. What do you need else, right? So this is the minimum elements of an s -bot. You must have things like dependencies, libraries, software components, the author, the supplier, license type, GPL, EGPL, version switch, and all these things. And there are various formats. I think there are three potentially popular formats in SBOM declaration. But regardless of that, this is the minimum elements of SBOM that you should have. Now, what is the risk in the absence of not having a software development? How many of you are not aware of log4j? If you are not aware of log4j, probably you are in the wrong conference, right? Log4j is something that spoiled our 2022 Happy New Year celebrations. Right? So, a piece of library, trusted, did a hack Additional research to Log4j stories identified that 50% of software that had Log4j were already end of life. So that out of the remaining 50% were not end of life, 80% of them never use log4j as their logging library, but they still have it. I mean, I'm more potentially unwanted software. So I can use the chip forward to remove it. Log4j is important. It's only 30 kb file that you there. Right? So what it does, of course it brings in greater transparency in your software supply chains, but it supports more secure software development. If I told you that in your enterprise, let's say you are a software development organization, and I told you the kind of tech stack that you have chosen to build your software has 50% elements that are probably going end of life in the next six months. Would you not go and change your development toolkit? Because what will happen is if you don't change it, the very first release of the software comes out, you are already vulnerable. Because you built it on already vulnerable software or you know, software that is about to go end of life in the next three, six, nine months. Right? So having a visibility on a bunch of elements around your software develop material becomes very, very important. It enables more informed decisions around the software selection. You are not going to go use a library from post today if you knew it was going to expand the next four months, right? And you'll also be able to respond quickly and efficiently to your vulnerabilities because you have total control and visibility on the bill of materials. Zero trust, probably the most talked about topic in the last pandemic era, right? Everybody loves zero trust. So you're already at Z. There's no letter beyond Z, so what will be after zero trust? Well, what it means is, for SBOM is, you must have an SBOM 
must have much sharing because this is also a potential attack surface. How many times? Now everybody knows Microsoft necessarily you will every patch to which they give you 350 things to fix. We don't complain because we call them, they are doing a good job, they are finding, disclosing and telling us how to fix it. We don't get rid of Microsoft. Similarly, this transparency is appreciated by your clients. So build an Xbox, make it public. Uh, of course, unless you have design elements into it that you do not want to share, but make it public because it's also a potential tax surface. Let your customers know what build your software. And when something goes wrong, then tell them, see, we always use the latest and the greatest available to us at all times, but things go wrong like log4j. So many endpoint security products use log4j as a logging library. They are all vulnerable, right? You can't blame the vendor. Like, we use the latest and the greatest. Why is it important? Because the risk of not having this visibility far outweighs not doing it. Right? And who should supply this as well? Any critical software vendor, be it IT, OT, security, identity, or even cloud providers, all the SaaS vendors that you use, as well as we are a premium SaaS vendor for the last 24 years, we've never had enterprise software, we're born in the cloud, right? All our contracts today, all our master services agreement, all our third party vendor is assessment from our customers, demands that we present them as well. And we happily provide it. You know why? Because that is my claim saying that trust my agent running on your machines because you are never going to be party to a you know, uh, software supply chain attack. And this is how I maintain it, this is my pipeline, this is how everything gets addressed. So that visibility brings you more, more trust. Right? So terms that are very ubiquitous are being used in exchange of each other. CSAM, Cyber Security Asset Manager. People build CMDB, become an IT subject. Log4j happened, people were not bothered about going to CMDB and looking at who is the asset owner. From where was this server bought? Not helping. They wanted to find out exposure data. Why did this happen? So you must build a asset inventory purpose built for cyber security. Don't make it look like there's an overlap with IT, so let IT do it. It's not helping. Right? At the end of the day, when something gets breached, you don't want to be uh, you know, pointing fingers or solve things together. So, Cyber security asset manager or cyber security bill of materials that include hardware, software, and as well together. So who would need it? Your customers will love it. Your lawyers would love it. Of course you will like it, right? How do I create an well? The easiest way? Ask a build teams. Because they're compiling code, they know what goes into it. That's the best way to do it. The worst way? Asking your software engineer, they use whatever is available. They'll go to a repo which is less trusted, copy code and paste it because they have to make it work faster. Right? Uh, ask your OS package manager. There are simple commands on Linux you can go and run say, solve the utils, install all the libraries, install RPA minus QA, get some of the for Windows also. Or ask your file system. Sometimes all these libraries are in your file system to just simple LS minus L into specific program of directories, you see all the things there. But the best way to do it is launching a quick scan with an asset inventory tool or a vulnerability scanning tool that has the ability to do deep discovery of your resolve. And like I told you in the beginning, you need deeper telemetry of your inventory that is purpose built for cyber security exercise and not for an IT exercise. Go full depth, go full wide. So it's not great to just identify a bigger category of devices. It's also important to put deeper into it. I found a switch, router, firewall, IDS, IPS, database, end, end system, Windows server, Linux server, container, workload. Great, that's the breadth of it. Go deeper now. If I find a running container, what was the image that was used to spin up this container? What is the telephone template of this image? What is this container made of? Right? Where did all these things come from? That is your deeper delivery. I did a small Google search around kind of code bases being attacked. You know, this is a demographic that came out. Interestingly, 47% is third-party applications as expected, where you have the least control. You can't pick up your phone call and call a third-party vendor called WinZip. WinZip, you introduce 35 vulnerabilities by not giving the desktop. Nobody picks up. Probably Microsoft will. Well, this way, or I can wait, right?
So the reason I was trying to make it more informative because not everybody in the audience probably, you know, believes there is more every day. So I've got some frequently asked questions. I'm not, not sure how much of it I can cover today on the stage, but I'm more than glad to talk to you about all of them on the small booth that we have outside. How does an SBOM help in the event of a cyber attack? That's the first place you look at, you get long term check. In addition to doing a simple vulnerability management, how can SBOM help me by giving me a life cycle of every library? When did it go GA? When did it go end of life? When is it going end of service? What portion of my library is 32 bit, 64 bit, open source, commercial, freeware? This is priceless information. CIOs will be super happy when you give them this data. Won't SBOM be a roadmap for my attacker? So if you publish your SBOM, the attacker is very happy. Oh, now I know what is this software made of. Let me go and you know, do the easy way of attacking them. Actually, it is the reverse. It's also a roadmap to the best defense. Right? If you knew what you are running, and whatever you are running is vulnerable, you would build purpose-built rules to protect yourself from those things. Right? Does an SBOM require source code disclosure? Absolutely not. Does a list of software component I can expose by intellectual property? I think I covered that. Not necessarily unless your design is linked to certain libraries that are not so popular or people in your competition will get to know what they are using for faster performance. Right? If I make an SBOM, do I have to make it public? Again, depending on the nature of regulation that we are dealing with, or the customers are dealing with, it is always disclosed with an NDA in place. So you don't have to make it public unless you are a, you know, a, a vendor that is using a lot of GPL licenses. Does an SBOM increase my exposure to license violations? 50-50. Right? Uh, sometimes your things are not, not everything that you, that you do is your own creation. You get things from GitHub, here and there. So maybe there might be some accidental license violations. Okay, until you are selling your software to somebody who will probably do a software composition analysis. Look at what part of your code you cannot be sued for in the future before they buy. Right? And or else, unless you don't plan to sell it or it's an internal application, don't care about the violation. The reason it was sale in the first place is because they wanted somebody to copy it and use it. Okay? That's all for now. If you have more questions, feel free to ask me now or maybe at the small booth we have outside. Thank you, hopefully, hopefully it was useful. Thank you so much. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Devashish. Uh, Devashish, I would ask you to kindly wait uh, for a moment more. And I would like to call on stage Mr. Ashish Shah, CISO from Star Union Daichi Life Insurance, to kindly do the honors. Ashish, thank you so much for doing the honors. You don't have time for questions, no? uh, Maybe one? Oh, sure, absolutely. I mean, we can If can't you guys don't ask me a question, I'm going to ask you back. So. <laughs> I think, I think I did a good job teaching. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, nevertheless, uh, I would just like to tell you that uh, you can always uh, have the Ashish answer your questions offline after this session as well. And Qualys is there with the booth, so please do visit their booth space and please do engage with your sales team. And I'm sure they are going to help you with all your queries and questions and with their solutions and products. So thank you so much once again, Devashish. Ashish, if you could do the honors. Congratulations, Devashish, for that fantastic presentation. And thank you so much, Ashish, for doing the honors. And ladies and gentlemen, that was uh, Devashish Jyoti Prakash, Vice President Qualis, on the topic of the mother of all digital dark art.